Chapter Six of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in November two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Six, Politeness. What Christianity has done in Europe toward rousing compassion in the midst of belligerent horrors love of music and letters has done in japan the cultivation of tender feelings breeds considerate regard for the sufferings of others modesty and complaisance actuated by respect for others feelings are at the root of politeness that courtesy and urbanity of manners which has been noticed by every foreign tourist as a marked japanese trait politeness is a poor virtue if it is actuated only by a fear of offending good taste whereas it should be the outward manifestation of a sympathetic regard for the feelings of others. It also implies a due regard for the fitness of things, therefore due respect to social positions, for these latter express no plutocratic distinctions, but were originally distinctions for actual merit. In its highest form, politeness almost approaches love. We may reverently say, politeness suffereth long and is kind, envieth not vaunteth not itself is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own is not easily provoked taketh not account of evil is it any wonder that professor dean in speaking of the six elements of humanity accords to politeness an exalted position inasmuch as it is the ripest fruit of social intercourse while thus extolling politeness far be it from me to put it in the front rank of virtues if we analyze it we shall find it correlated with other virtues of a higher order for what virtue stands alone while or rather because it was exalted as peculiar to the profession of arms and as such esteemed in a degree higher than its deserts there came into existence its counterfeits Confucius himself has repeatedly taught that external appurtenances are as little a part of propriety as sounds are of music. When propriety was elevated to the sine qua non of social intercourse, it was only to be expected that an elaborate system of etiquette should come into vogue to train youth in correct social behavior. How one must bow in accosting others, how we must walk and sit, were taught and learned with utmost care table manners grew to be a science tea serving and drinking were raised to a ceremony a man of education is of course expected to be master of all these very fitly does mr veblen in his interesting book theory of the leisure class call decorum a product and an exponent of the leisure class life i have heard slighting remarks made by europeans upon our elaborate discipline of politeness it has been criticized as absorbing too much of our thought and in so far a folly to observe strict obedience to it i admit that there may be unnecessary niceties in ceremonious etiquette but whether it partakes as much of folly as the adherence to ever-changing fashions of the west is a question not very clear to my mind even fashions i do not consider solely as freaks of vanity on the contrary I look upon these as a ceaseless search of the human mind for the beautiful. Much less do I consider elaborate ceremony as altogether trivial, for it denotes the result of long observation as to the most appropriate method of achieving a certain result. If there is anything to do, there is certainly a best way to do it, and the best way is both the most economical and the most graceful. Mr. Spencer defines grace as the most economical manner of motion. The tea ceremony presents certain definite ways of manipulating a bowl, a spoon, a napkin, etc. To a novice it looks tedious, but one soon discovers that the way prescribed is, after all, the most saving of time and labor, in other words, the most economical use of force, hence, according to Spencer's dictum, the most graceful. The spiritual significance of social decorum, or I might say, to borrow from the vocabulary of the philosophy of clothes, the spiritual discipline of which etiquette and ceremony are mere outward garments, is out of all proportion to what their appearance warrants us in believing. 
I might follow the example of Mr. Spencer and trace in our ceremonial institutions their origins and the moral motives that gave rise to them, but that is not what I shall endeavor to do in this book. It is the moral training involved in strict observance of propriety that I wish to emphasize. I have said that etiquette was elaborated into the finest niceties, so much so that different schools advocating different systems came into existence. But they all united in the ultimate essential, and this was put by a great exponent of the best-known school of etiquette, the Ogasawara, in the following terms. The end of all etiquette is to so cultivate your mind that even when you are quietly seated, not the roughest ruffian can dare make onset on your person. It means, in other words, that by constant exercise and correct manners, one brings all the parts and faculties of his body into perfect order and into such harmony with itself and its environment as to express the mastery of spirit over the flesh. What a new and deep significance the French word bienseance comes thus to contain. If the premise is true that gracefulness means economy of force, then it follows as a logical sequence that a constant practice of graceful deportment must bring with it a reserve and storage of force. Fine manners, therefore, mean power in repose. When the barbarian Gauls, during the sack of Rome, burst into the assembled senate and dared pull the beards of the venerable fathers, we think the old gentlemen were to blame, inasmuch as they lacked dignity and strength of manners. Is lofty spiritual attainment really possible through etiquette? Why not? All roads lead to Rome. As an example of how the simplest thing can be made into an art and then become spiritual culture, I may take Cha No Yu, the tea ceremony. Tea sipping as a fine art. Why should it not be? In the children drawing pictures on the sand, or in the savage carving on a rock, was the promise of a Raphael or a Michelangelo. How much more is the drinking of a beverage, which began with the transcendental contemplation of a Hindu anchorite, entitled to develop into a handmaid of religion and morality? That calmness of mind, that serenity of temper, that composure and quietness of demeanor, which are the first essentials of Cha No Yu, are without doubt the first conditions of right thinking and right feeling. The scrupulous cleanliness of the little room, shut off from sight and sound of the madding crowd, is in itself conductive to direct one's thoughts from the world. The bare interior does not engross one's attention like the innumerable pictures and bric-a-brac of a western parlor. The presence of kakemono, hanging scrolls which may be either paintings or ideograms used for decorative purposes, calls our attention more to grace of design than to beauty of color. The utmost refinement of taste is the object aimed at, whereas anything like display is banished with religious horror. The very fact that it was invented by a contemplative recluse in a time when wars and the rumors of wars were incessant is well calculated to show that this institution was more than a pastime. Before entering the quiet precincts of the tea room, the company assembling to partake of the ceremony laid aside, together with their swords, the ferocity of the battlefield or the cares of government, there to find peace and friendship. Cha no Yu is more than a ceremony. It is a fine art. It is poetry, with articulate gestures for rhythm. It is a modus operandi of soul discipline. Its greatest value lies in this last phase. Not infrequently the other faces preponderated in the mind of its votaries, but that does not prove that its essence was not of a spiritual nature. Politeness will be a great acquisition if it does not more than impart grace to manners, but its function does not stop here. For propriety, springing as it does from motives of benevolence and modesty, and actuated by tender feelings toward the sensibilities of others, is ever a graceful expression of sympathy. Its requirement is that we should weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Such didactic requirement, when reduced into small everyday details of life, expresses itself in little acts scarcely noticeable, or, if noticed is, as one missionary lady of twenty years' residence once said to me, awfully funny. You are out in the hot glaring sun with no shade over you, 
a Japanese acquaintance passes by, you accost him, and instantly his hat is off. While that is perfectly natural, but the awfully funny performance is that all the while he talks with you, his parasol is down, and he stands in the glaring sun also. How foolish! Yes, exactly so, provided the motive were less than this. You are in the sun, I sympathize with you. I would willingly take you under my parasol if it were large enough, or if we were familiarly acquainted. As I cannot shade you, I will share your discomforts. Little acts of this kind, equally or more amusing, are not mere gestures or conventionalities. They are the bodying forth of thoughtful feelings for the comfort of others. Another awfully funny custom is dictated by our canons of politeness, but many superficial writers on Japan have dismissed it by simply attributing it to the general topsy-turviness of the nation. Every foreigner who has observed it will confess the awkwardness he felt in making proper reply upon the occasion. In America, when you make a gift, you sing its praises to the recipient. In Japan, we depreciate or slander it. The underlying idea with you is, this is a nice gift, if it were not nice, I would not dare give it to you, for it will be an insult to give you anything but what is nice. In contrast to this, our logic runs, you are a nice person, and no gift is nice enough for you. You will not accept anything I can lay at your feet except as a token of my good will, so accept this, not for its intrinsic value, but as a token. It will be an insult to your worth to call the best gift good enough for you. Place the two ideas side by side, and we see that the ultimate idea is one and the same. Neither is awfully funny. The American speaks of the material which makes the gift. The Japanese speaks of the spirit which prompts the gift. It is perverse reasoning to conclude, because our sense of propriety shows itself in all the smallest ramifications of our deportment, to take the least important of them and uphold it as the type, and pass judgment upon the principle itself. Which is more important, to eat, or to observe rules of propriety about eating? A Chinese sage answers, If you take a case where the eating is all important, and the observing the rules of propriety is of little importance, and compare them together, why merely say that the eating is of the more importance? Metal is heavier than feathers, but does that saying have reference to a single clasp of metal and a wagon load of feathers? Take a piece of wood a foot thick and raise it above the pinnacle of a temple, none would call it taller than the temple. To the question, which is the more important, to tell the truth or to be polite, the Japanese are said to give an answer diametrically opposite to what the American will say but I forbear any comment until I come to speak of veracity or truthfulness, without which politeness is a farce and a show. End of chapter 6